We have Lydia Diamond, Kirsten Greenidge, Keith Joseph Atkins, playwrights, who will join us up here. <laughs> who have all arrived this evening in Baltimore, some for the first time, some not for the first time. Uh, we've had a few moments to start the conversation, warm it up, but uh, they'll be thinking fresh here along with you. And uh, to moderate, or really more to be part of the conversation, uh, as I think everyone will be initiating many ideas, is uh, Kwame Kweyama, our artistic director. <laughs> 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 Joining us in a minute. Pay no attention. I like to be introduced. While being wired. That's right. Are very, very wired, very well traveled. Uh, just, just for the purposes of the conversation in here, uh, perhaps make sure that your cell phone rings are turned off. However, you are welcome, as far as I know, to take photographs. Be great if you don't do flash photography, uh, just so it doesn't get in their eyes, I guess. Uh, but you can take photographs. That doesn't apply once you go downstairs, of course. Equity rules uh, take over. But feel free to photograph for posterity also up here. Uh, we'll do 15 or 20 minutes, I think, was the thought. Uh, and then uh, ensure that we turn it out to there. Uh, partly because of the logistics of the live stream. If you have a comment or question to, to share, uh, once we do that, the mic will be set up down here. And I would ask that uh, you make your way over here to share your comments so that we can all hear it and it goes out. But anyway, without further ado, Kwame. Thank you, Gavin. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to this, what I think, well actually, I, I know will be a, a wonderful debate with three writers and, and, and organizers that are an activist that, are, that I respect so very much. Um, I said, or we discussed before we came in, that even though I'm in the moderator's chair, uh, we don't really do things that way. These are wonderful minds and, and intellects. And so it's really, we'll start off with just a little conversation amongst ourselves, but really anybody can lead it at any one time. Um, I, I want to begin, if I may, by saying hello to everybody at home. And um, hi, that's the nine. Have we got over 10 people yet? <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Uh, yeah, we have, woo! Hey, double figures at home. We love you. Please send in your questions uh, because we will try to answer them as well. I mean, I suppose I wanted to begin, and anybody can answer this, really, by speaking a little to the world that you walked into as a playwright. I know we're going to be talking about expanding the, the black narrative if, in fact, it needs any expansion. But I'd, I'd love to just kind of know the worlds that you walked into as, as playwrights. Maybe, Lydia, maybe we'll begin with you. I'll go first. Um, it's interesting. It's hard to answer the question without thinking about it, um, without sort of backing into it from how things look now. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. And I'm gonna say when I went, um, when I graduated college, we didn't, we didn't do the Google thing. We didn't have Google. And so um, actually I was, in my junior year, I started playwriting. I didn't know I was a playwright yet. And um, I was writing because I was an actor. And at the institution that I was studying at, I was one of a very, I was one of two people of color in the theater department. And I was not being able to be cast as m much. So I'd, I'd gone off campus, but then I, um, with a great deal of hubris, you know, I was 21, thought I was inventing roles because I hadn't been introduced to the playwrights who had already written really beautiful things that I might have been able to do. So the landscape looked bleak, and that was good for me because it made me um, sort of have a, an activist sense that I needed to add voices and roles. I feel that also, 23 years ago, I wasn't seeing contemporary plays for people of color. I wasn't seeing us get very much, very often, to get to wear like elegant clothes on stage. And um, I, I wanted to be able to sort of make a space for, for us to be in diverse rooms and be horribly flawed and terribly funny and very clever in rooms with people who didn't look like us. Um, and so the landscape looked a little more bleak than it was, but it was relatively bleak. I, I don't think there was much diversity. Excellent. Kristen, do you want to go? 
I mean, I think I would have to agree that, that the landscape did look, when I started writing plays, I wanted to write roles that I would think that uh, black actors would be proud to play. And uh, I too wasn't, I don't think I was as adept at knowing how many roles actually did exist already that the plays weren't being produced or um, had been written 30 or 40 years ago and were no longer being produced if they had, if they had been at initially. So I too walked into a world that I thought actually was much bleaker than it actually was, and yet, um, uh, you know, when I started writing plays, I, I, I kept it a secret because I didn't think I could write a play being black and a woman. And so uh, what was wonderful as I began to uh, have more opportunity and go to more festivals and meet more people is I realized how many um, black writers are actually writing, and that was really affirming. And uh, one thing that I think they'll stay the same is the amount of um, uh, writing by black writers that actually does get produced is not, hasn't changed in a way that I would have thought it was 20 years ago when I started writing plays. Keith. Um, I kind of agree with both Lydia and this wonderful alum. Mike, we, we actually both went to University of Iowa mm -hmm. um, Playwrights Workshop. Yay. Okay. Um, uh, for me, uh, I was actually living in San Francisco, Oakland um, for a while, and I was part of the uh, what they then called performance poetry scene, then morphed into the spoken word scene. Um, and so for me, I was inundated and surrounded with a lot of political conversation, political art, um, and, uh, and one day a friend of mine challenged me. She said, your, your poems are like monologues. You should write a play. And so basically what I did, I, I read um, Raising the Sun like 50 times, <laughs> no lie, and I wrote a play called Plum Wine Dreaming, which was basically a rip off of Raising the Sun. <laughs> and so a friend of my, my same friend came to one of my readings of this play and said, you basically ripped off Raising the Sun. Um, but I actually, and I, I admit, I, I did. Um, but in, instead of a check, they were waiting for wine, you know, whatever. But um, what happened, I, I fell in love with, with playwriting, and I, I fell in love with um, politics on stage and social justice on stage. And so um, I, I, you know, applied to several different programs for playwriting. I got into the University of Iowa, um, and I was, surprised that they weren't ready for me, even though they accepted me. Um, they weren't ready for how anxious I was to put politics on stage. They weren't ready for the lack of actors. Um, I had to go outside of the theater department where my peers actually could pull from the MFA acting program and I had to actually find people who were in the engineering program who one day did a church play, you know, that kind of thing. Should have given you some of my posters from Right, <laughs> right. We had to go all over campus, like hunting down people. Um, so by the time I actually um, came out of um, Iowa and and was in New York City, I was surprised even more so that um, the world that I was so allowed to play in as a poet and as a, um, a MFA student um, wasn't the world of theater institutionally. Um, people weren't as interested in the layered, complex, funny you know, rich, poor, black experience, there was some, this one narrative that everyone was sort of trying to force me into. It was like, be August Wilson, be Lorraine Hansberry, be August Wilson. And I was like, well, I love August, I love Lorraine, but I'm from Ohio, my mom is Catholic, my dad is Baptist, I wanna write about that. Um, and that's been the struggle, and that for me, um, sort of showed me that it was a little bleak that it was gonna be a struggle. The hallmark of all of your works and when I arrived here, I mean, I, I, I knew of all of you before I arrived in America, of course, I'd read your plays and, and been big fans. But I think, and, and, and forgive me for being, if this sounds, however it sounds, but I think I found you and, and maybe another, probably only a, a, another few playwrights who seem to have the hallmark of cerebral activity as part of their theme that, that seem to write from the, you know, the cerebral cortex rather than the experiential, I have lived in the ghetto or I have lived or, I, no, talk to me a little bit, either of you, any of you, about, about writing outside of the box. Writing, and when I say the box, I mean a box that, I, I, I'm, and I'm in no way chastising any writer that does that. I have written many of those plays myself. Um, but, but talk a little bit about trying to stretch beyond 
the narrative that feels that like if I do this, I'll get produced? Well, I, when I was in Iowa, um, I, for my first plays uh, took place in like an uh, unnamed mid-Atlantic type state, somewhat southern maybe, and I'm from, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. And I remember uh, having a, a, a feedback session with Oscar Eustace. And he said, you know, I like this play. And it's a play that I had sent around and had gotten a couple of awards and it had gotten me into grad school, certainly. And so I was very proud of it. And um, he said, I like this play and it's, it's good. But uh, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. He goes, okay. And he said, uh, uh, what do your parents do? I said, well, my dad is a lawyer and my mom is a social worker. And he said, so that's not really in this play. Um, you, you should feel empowered to write who you are in your play and where you come from. And it doesn't have to be um, from the ghetto if you're not from the ghetto. Uh, uh, and that was actually mind boggling to me that I could write about people that I knew and I, and I had grown up with. And I, I didn't have to appropriate um, playwrights of past years to be able to get, I mean, I, so that was, that was mind-boggling and my writing changed after that. Um, so that, that's Lydia? where that lands for me. I think because I didn't um, identify as a playwright early because I thought I was an actor who was writing plays for actors, I didn't, I didn't actually, that's funny. That's Someone funny. at home said <laughs> you really like what you just said. <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't actually um, feel the constraints of what I was expected to write or what I should write. I was very lucky that way. Um, I was the girl who sometimes, you know, almost got beat up on the playground for talking proper. Or, you know, the girl who was the one black girl in the all-white college town and I'd be having a crush on the one black boy and he was having a crush on all the white girls. <laughs> right? No. And so I, um, I was only writing my experiences because to me they were very authentic and it hadn't occurred to me that there was anything else. And I don't think, I don't know, I don't think that I was unique in that. I think that it's just really hard for the diversity of um, African American voices to get produced. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to say I had, I'm sure there were other black girls getting their ass kicked for talking proper. And I'm sure they were writing plays about it. But um, I think that what Center Stage is doing and I think that what now several more companies are doing is giving a, a, a wider range of voices so that those of us who have been sort of screaming into the wind uh, are actually having our screams have a chance to land. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, I'm just kind of stuck with this question because I feel that there is a lot of advocacy um, and encouragement to, to break the mold and do things outside of the box and the promise of that outside of the box thing being produced. I feel like that is a conversation that's been happening. I do feel like a lot of theater companies and institutions are eager to see that happen um, in development and how they commission. However, I don't see the producing... I don't, I see a lot of development and not a lot of production. Um, and, you know, I, I, I started an organization a couple years ago, years ago called the New Black Fest, which is a festival, <laughs> a festival that I wanted to do to um, encourage and celebrate the diversity within the black experience that I, that I felt that one, that the black demographic and black artists were not necessarily subscribing to because everyone was subscribing to the larger institutional narrative. And so I wanted black people to learn that there are black folks in Germany or there's black people who are from Massachusetts or, you know, and, and, but also um, expose the larger community, theater going community to that diversity as well. And to see that diversity as being potential things that can be produced and make money. Um, and so I'm still not convinced that although there is a lot of encouragement and advocacy around diversifying the black narrative, that it actually is happening and making a real impact. And I think that, for me, that it, it's taking individuals and, and smaller collectives to make something, to make the puncture happen. So. I, would, I would absolutely agree. I would absolutely agree. And I think that another conversation to be had is about 
the ethnically specific, the well, black theater companies and how they're struggling and the people who've been telling the stories um, consistently for all of these years aren't being able to do that anymore. That's really frightening to me. Uh, but then there's also an aesthetic thing that I find disturbing and really interesting, which is that there are safety zones around which, and you know, maybe only not in Baltimore, in very few places have I seen regional theater audiences be diverse. And so I feel as though there's this comfort zone in white audiences around the way we've been taught to expect that people of color interact with each other and look on stage. And so aesthetically, we've been sort of sort of boxed in. And again, I'm, I, I'm Pollyanna-ish about what writers write. I think writers write what they write. But even the very few productions that have gotten produced over a span of time have had to fit into a very narrow aesthetic, which I think is where we started. You started us with that. I, 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 I think I agree. And, and this is going to be my last question before I jump out. Um, Do you have something going on today? Yeah, just a little thing. <laughs> <laughs> something that I thought I'd wear a really quiet suit to. Um, that, um, on a scale of one, I always worry about this question, but when it goes through my mind, because there are so many connotations, but on a scale of one to 10, how bored are we of having to talk through the context of race? All right, I'll start, <laughs> as I throw it out. Uh, and I would say that on any given day and at any given moment, it fluctuates. I, um, and any different context, it fluctuates. But I would say on a scale of one to 10, and being someone who is behind this debate, I think I'm about a nine and three quarters, <laughs> um, as an average, on talking about race. And that doesn't mean that I do not feel that race is phenomenally important, but I do think on a scale of one to 10 that I, I, I find myself frustrated by the perception of a box mm. rather than the, than the world which says all of our writing styles are different, but they're equally as valid and that while I can speak about it through the lens of race, I would far rather speak about it through the lens of a practicing playwright trying to tell the best stories that I can through my specific cultural lens and that not being labeled. All right, that was a long one to 10, but anyway. <laughs> Anyone else? Eight. <laughs> but nine. Oh, eight and a half. <laughs> it's not the talking about it that I mind. I actually, you know, over the course of my career have been called upon to talk about it so much that I fancy myself as really quite good at talking about it. <laughs> I don't mind talking about it. What I don't like is talking and talking and talking for years and nothing changes. Yeah. So that's, that's the problem. It's fun to talk about stuff you're good at talking about and you've got some anecdotes and ooh, it's hard, it's hard. But <laughs> it's, the, it's the things not changing that I would make it like a 12. Very good. Things, good. I'm, I'm, did anybody else want to jump in on that? No, don't, I can see you because. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I grow weary of it. I grow weary of it because sometimes the weariness does take away from being able to engage with being a playwright in a different type of way. Um, so weary as well. Please, oh, please, please. Too much. No, no, no. no. Well, uh, the other thing that I will say that has happened recently is there's been lots and lots, uh, J Jack, Jacqueline, you've been, there's been lots and lots of talk around gender parity. And I only have recently realized that I've never been invited into that conversation because I always get to talk about being black. And so I also am becoming aware of what happens when the, we're called to talk about race. And I think that the people who've asked me to be on panels and talk about race actually have great intentions. And I've worked with theater companies that actually have really made progress. 
and have listened to me, and you've worked with, I mean, uh, there are certainly people working really hard, but I think we're collectively, the theater community, really smart. We solve problems. We make, like, angels come down from the sky. <laughs> I don't know why it's hard to figure out how to diversify the audiences and diversify the theaters. Okay, I'm done. Okay, can, can I tag on to what you're saying? Um, I, I, okay, so a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to sit on a panel to talk about race um, in New York. And, um, to talk and, about what? <laughs> race. <laughs> Um, what was interesting was that um, it was a, a, a Shakespeare production that was diversified in, in the way they sort of aesthetically did it. And blah, 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 blah. So anyway, basically what happened afterwards, there was a panel discussion around diversity and race. And um, the artistic director um, was telling us a story about how he um, sat on this panel himself about diversity. Um, and everyone in the room was uh, white, male, except for one a Korean American woman. And the Korean American woman apparently got up to go to the restroom. And as soon as she walked out the door, someone said, why do we have to be responsible for this? Can't they do this themselves? Now this is apparently like as a legit grant given and receiving organization, right? I think you should say who it was. No, I'm no, not gonna say no, it. No. no, I'm not gonna say it. No, legal. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, um, the artistic director who was telling his story was saying how he was appalled by it and rightfully so, in that he just wanted to get up and leave because he didn't want to be a part of that dynamic. He did not want his aesthetic or his theater to, to benefit or even whatever. So a woman in the audience who claimed to be a PhD student who her work was around race um, said to him, that's a cop out. She said, no, what you needed to do is stay in that room and tell those people that this is how you deal with diversity. You deal with it head on. She said, because we need more of you in the rooms with them to advocate for us because we're not in those rooms. So instead of you saying, I don't want to be a part of this, part of this, or that I'm not too good for this, actually, no, you are the warrior that they need in that room. So I just wanted to put that out there. I, I, my last comment is actually, I had a remarkable thing the other day um, happen to me. Uh, I was amid a discussion with three or four different um, theaters, and someone had written a letter in complaining about something that we had collectively done. And and they said, but there are no black people in your organizations. And I was a bit like, and I was really in a dilemma. I was a bit like, do I say hello? <laughs> On the flip side, do I go, yes! Because actually, in, in some bizarre way, that they had disavowed me of my cultural attributes. <laughs> and, 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 and that somehow it felt like, and it was really weird, because what I decided at the end was that, was that the person who'd written that letter had said that I am the black head of a white institution. And I just saw myself being the head of an institution. And so I find myself, as I say, as, as I, I went home that night to talk about it to my wife, and I, I went, I am so bored about talking about race today but I am so excited to have other people across the country who actually can be, jump inside the box when they're called for, but can jump outside of the box when needed, and can create work that speaks to all the interlocking communities in America that they serve. Let me, let me go out to anyone in the audience. Please, there is a microphone here. So Are you me. in the lobby? You're, Hello. You're a Benita. Oh you're my God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you watched I, it. I am in the lobby. So Kwame, I think I've heard you say in the past that you find the conversation that we, many of us, understand why you were bored by it, more so in here in the US than you found at home. So I'd love some perspective on that. Maybe I misunderstood, but I'd love your perspective on that. Um, I think, um, Benita, um, <laughs> I, I think what I, what I think I may have been hinting at was that the debate around race seems to be more foregrounded in America 
than I am used to in, in Britain. That's not to say that it is not exactly the same thing and doesn't manifest in almost the same ways. But there is a frankness to the American personality that allows conversations to happen directly that in Britain happen subtextually. And so you find yourself having to, 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 to go, what did you say? As opposed to, don't say that again. If that's a metaphor, if that metaphor works. Hi, Kwame and uh, the whole bunch of you. It's great to be here. And I can't believe on this world premiere night you're doing this an hour before your show, uh, which I cannot understand, but you're an amazing individual. Uh, this is for Lydia, really, because um, I cover theater in the Baltimore, Washington area for broadwayworld.com, and I had the privilege of seeing Stick Fly down in Washington, I think it was at the arena. And in my review, I said, this should go to Broadway, and it did. So I just wanted to get your feeling as a playwright. What was that feeling like, having this play done in, in a regional theater being taken to Broadway? Well, first of all, thank you. <laughs> you played no small role in that, I'm sure. And um, it was trippy. It was really, really wonderful. You can't feel when you're sitting in the middle of a moment like that. You, you, it doesn't feel as much like a moment as it does like you're putting up a play. And then people say, do you do realize that you're in a moment? <laughs> and, um, and, but I've only actually now a year later been able to look back and really see what the moment was. And we can have drinks. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Good, thank you, someone's coming straight to it. Good evening, pleasure being here. Um, bored, being bored, being black, we are bored. And it's interesting, you mentioned that being white, they don't want to talk about it. That's why we become bored. So my question to you, and I, you know, and I've got gray, so I've been around a little bit. I was in New York, and there were bastions of black theater everywhere, which the voices were there that could be seen, you know, if we were lucky enough. So my question to you, what do you think we need to do? Um, stick fly, wonder if I can see if I heard about it. You know, so that's commercial. We're talking about commercial, but how do we get those voices out? What do you think we need to do to get those voices out? Um, like I said, in New York, all these, and those theaters are starting to die also because they're not being supported. Some are coming back, but what do we do to really get the voices out there and even to change artistic directors, names, um, minds, and stuff like that. Who wants to take that first? Well, I would say, first of all, it doesn't start out commercial theater. It starts out, my, my play, Stickfly, started out at an all-black theater company, Congo Square, the gentleman who directed, <laughs> the gentleman who directed Kwame's show tonight um, came and saw a reading of it, and I hadn't written the other half because I, I was pregnant. I don't know why I looked at you. That was weird. <laughs> She has children, and we talk about being mothers and theater makers, but um, came to see it. So I also think there's something about the way to figure out how. So my, my thought is to figure out how to acknowledge the ecology of the food chain of the way that theater works, um, and to figure out how economically to make sure the people who are fertilizing the world actually are reaping the benefits of that fertilization economically later. And I also want to, I also think there is an artistic or aesthetic thing we were talking about earlier that's a problem um, that, that I've noticed and observed within the black theater community in New York City. There's a lot of recycling of the same types of storytelling. Um, you know, although I, you know, pay major homage and respect to, you know, writers like Ed Bullins and the works of Woody King Jr. Um, you know, those are some great folks and they're still doing great work. However, I do feel that that generation of theater makers um, are not necessarily engaging with the younger generation of theater makers. And that there's this recycling of those same plays and they um, are also nurturing younger playwrights who I feel are sort of regurgitating the same style and aesthetic. And that's fine, that there's a place for that. But like we're talking about today, there is a diverse aesthetic that has been growing, that has been in existence. I mean, even Adrienne Kennedy, um, um, her work 
you know, when she was writing and still, and still um, was considered way, way, way off base, even from the, for, the, for the black community. And so I do feel like there needs to be some advocacy around what we as audience members demand to see of ourselves. Because a lot of times I think that the black community in particular subscribe to one narrative about ourselves, even though it's not necessarily our personal narrative. And that it's important that we actually, one, learn who we are, specifically, not generally, learn our history specifically, not when someone else is sort of subscribe or sort of informing you about your history. And then that for me is a way for us as a demographic and as an audience to demand those stories to be on stage, to, to say, that's great to do August Wilson for the second time this year, but can you guys actually do a story about my grandmother's family who was actually from Cambridge, Mass, and they were boat sellers? I mean, whatever it is, you know. Uh, <laughs> but just to, um, to be advocates for your own diversity. Um, while this question's coming up, which I hope is a question and not a restroom break, dash. Um, but but I, I, here's something that I wrestle with, guys. I wrestle with a lot. Um, that, you know, I am. Derek and I, Derek Sanders, who's directed the, the Raisin Cycle, we talk about this a lot. We are sons of August. Now, Derek was very fortunate in that his direct experience with August um, allowed him to set up his theatre company or made him set up his theatre company. I am son of August in that, though I never saw him, only saw him from afar, was so inspired by his manhood and personhood through his writing and that he did not sell truth for access. That, that, I, that, that I, though 4,000 miles away and of a different culture, could feel inspired to want to contribute. But I hear a lot of this kind of, I hear a lot of kind of, and it's not August dissing, and I'm not saying that you were doing this in any form, but I hear a lot of, oh my God, I've always been asked to be August, and so I want to push away from that. How do we stand on the shoulders of our giants? How do we keep them center of our, of our universe, build upon their canon, and still find our own identity? Does it have to be a either or? It can't be. It absolutely can't be. I, I, um, and I think that we, I like to think that we have a sense of our history that way. But um, it, it does concern me that there, there tends to be, even around the conversation that we're having about aesthetics, it seems that there's always a, this, this either or, this push, this pull, and I, I don't know why we can't all just be friends and make art. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to make light of that, though. What you're saying, I think, is really very important, and I don't know that we're teaching our young people, and you know what else? The demographics of the theater programs in this country aren't actually changing. Another thing to be critiqued and really, really scream about, um, and so, how would we learn how to have respect for and honor if we're not even being taught? I didn't see an Audrey and Kennedy play until I was grown up. I mean, I think there's a myth that there isn't enough room for everybody at the table. And, and that is a myth about, about America, that there's not enough room, and there is enough room at the table for everybody. And I think once that myth is dispelled, that there's only certain slots, there's only a certain amount of slots, you've got your four slots in February and that's it, is ridiculous. Um, and I think things won't really change until that myth is, is exploded a bit. And then the art is better because we're in dialogue with one another. I agree. Hi. <laughs> That actually leads to my question in some ways. Um, one of the things that, and you're an alum of mine from Northwestern Performance Studies, love it. Um, but, um, Wildcats, yes, Wildcats. Um, but the real question that I wanted to ask, and I'm really concerned about this idea of race fatigue, um, and I, I think that the, this, this is a current, right, within American culture, and I'm wondering if it's really not a race fatigue, but it's the fact that race has been so static a concept that we don't do what Lydia suggested in terms of talking about race, gender, sexuality, and class 
as being collaborators, right? Like the way in which they collaborate and are in dialogue, right? And so for me, what's fascinating about your work is not so much this question of the cerebral or the heart or the emotion, but it's really when you can actually bring all of these worlds together, where we talk about the fertilizers of the world as being equally important as these kind of uh, patriarchal figures, men, if you will. Um, I think when they come together, that's what made August beautiful to me, was not his machismo manliness, but the way in which he was able to create conversations between folks. And so I'm wondering about that tension. How do you find that tension in your work? And do you find that to be a productive place to create as well? Maybe a clarification about what the tension is. I so come can back. You just clarify oh, what the tension is. Yeah. So you you wanted me to clarify yes. the the tension. What is the tension? Okay. So the tension between having to do quote unquote a race play, right? Mm -hmm. If we think about them in that way, I, I don't actually think that as producers of of work, right? At least for me, I should say, in my work, I'm not thinking about like I'm creating a black play, right? But I'm often thinking about intersections, right? So when I'm talking about, when I'm building a play about a community, right, I have to think about communities don't just involve brown people, right? It's women, gays, lesbians, straight people, reproductive people, people who don't produce, right? Like all of these things, like we have to really, you know, dig deep for that. And I think sometimes we discount what's really going on in this race fatigue because we don't really realize that it's much more complicated. There are real tensions here um, that we're kind of unpacking. I think sometimes there is the push. I, I, I can only speak for myself, but I think sometimes there is the push to create plays that aren't as complex for whatever reason, and that, and that it's sometimes seen as easier to produce those on a wide scale. I don't know if that, I don't think that's true. I hope it's not true, um, but I know sometimes when you you know, you bring in a first mess of a draft and, it, and it's all complex. There is the, the, the feeling sometimes to make it, to, to put it into a specific box. I don't necessarily create from that way, but I know that sometimes that, that does seep in because of the commercial nature of, of what gets produced. I mean, yeah, I, I thought I had a response to that, but now that I think about it, that's a really complicated question. I don't, I don't know if I have an answer I don't know if I personally have an answer for that. I, I, d I do. Oh, good. Okay, maybe. <laughs> maybe you help me. I think this whole idea of race fatigue is a nice diversionary tactic for getting our eyes off of the problem. And I don't know why we would be fatigued talking about something that statistically is so tangibly a problem still. So it's interesting because I just wrote a play and I was having the hardest time talking about it in the press um, because I was sort of wiggling around, oh, what is it about? It's about the intersection of the blah, blah, blah and how they bounce against each other and the blah, blah, blah and the tensions of the yada, yada, yada. And you know what? It's a race play. And I was like, white men can write race plays. I can write a frickin' race play and I don't feel fatigued. Um, I just think that we have now the challenge of writing the race play at a level that is deserving of the, the, the nuance and the sophistication of the conversation. It has to be worthy. And, and I, I, I worry at even trying to uh, slightly um, disagree. Okay. <laughs> but only slightly. <laughs> I, and you can't argue with you on your opening. Oh, you can. <laughs> you can. It's all good. What is that thing that's happening downstairs? Um, I, 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 the only reason I, and I don't really disagree, I just wish to throw into the mix that if I'm in Nigeria, a country of 180 to 200 million people, and I write about my family and I write about my community, is it a race play or is it a human play? No, but I'm just saying mine is a race play. Yeah, and yours may be a race play, but I, if that play was written in Nigeria, would it be a race play? No, I, I know what you're saying. I hear you. I, I, can, I, can I, can I, it's your house. <laughs> no, listen, I'm giving you the room to fight me in my house. It's all good. But, but, might we, but might we complicate that to say that in America, I think that that's the distinction, right, is that 
in America, race functions so much as culture, right? And so that we can't really disaggregate, disconnect culture from race. And we keep trying to, like we say, a race play. We're really talking about like a fruitful culture. We're, we're, we're doing you, your work, all of your work that I've seen in Chicago, New York, all over. I know that it speaks to certain types of cultural richness. Right? Kwame, I just don't know that we have the luxury. Thank you. I don't know that we have the luxury. It would be great if I lived in a place with 80 million people who looked like me, but I live in a place in which the people who look like the people in my audiences enslaved the people who look like me. There's a conversation to be had. I, I think there is. I think there's absolutely, and I think the comment about race fatigue is a magnificent one because, and your comment about it, is that it can be a diversion. I think that's absolutely right. What I fear, however, is that we paint ourselves into a corner of storytelling that means that we are, the way we access it is often through our pigmentation or our culture. And I firmly believe, and I describe myself as a black political playwright, I have no problems with that. But I also perceive it as being a member of the majority of the globe rather than a minority of the globe. I think the tension, no, you know what? There's a lady on crutches. Oh, sorry. <laughs> And, and we're going to ask that this be the last question, just so we can make oh, sure. Don't you, worry, we can push the back. Just Okay. <laughs> it's, it's your house, so. <laughs> anyway, Shirley, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Shirley Bassfield Dunlap, and I'm coordinator of theater at an HBCU, Morgan State University. And um, I'm very proud to be able to say that some of my students have gone on to graduate school at Cal Arts or, um, uh, actor studio and so forth because we do want to um, get rid of that stereotype that black universities are only training their students to be excellent audience members. But um, I also am a um, PhD student who, uh, who is um, interested in um, studying race and gender. Um, but also from a directorial point of view, uh, I'm an SDC a member, and it really kind of hits hard when you have a, you know, a, a board member say, "Oh, this was the best February play we had, you know, in years." Or for a person to say, "You know, well, so and so really doesn't have a problem with white people directing his or her play." That becomes very challenging. So um, I ask the question: I'd like to know your thoughts on um, the black director, and especially since New York Times had a wonderful article, two days, uh, in which they talked about uh, women directors making their way to Broadway as if maybe they had lost their way or something, um, <laughs> had lost the map. But of all of those women, it was only one um, black female director. And I'm, I'm having some challenges uh, about that. I know my first gig was, thank goodness, that the um, playwright was the one that was had a, 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 um, a handle on her play. And if it weren't for her, I would not have been able to make that breakthrough that she won you know, for her recommendation. So I wanted to sort of change it. I'm not bored with race, and I'm not bored with black plays. But I would like to talk about the people who tell your story. I, I would like to jump in first on, on that. Um, yes. Yes. I, I feel you. Um, one of my challenges is um, who's telling our stories and who has power over the production of our stories. And for, it's, it's a double, and it's a double-edged sword because one, you know, as an artist, I want, I think that people should be able to tell whatever story they feel they, they can tell and they should be able to do whatever they want to do. But at the same time, what happens is that because the larger institution, the larger white community is running mostly all the theater companies that have any real um, economic, you know, whatever in, in the country, that um, a black play can be produced and then the a white director is chosen and then it leaves out the opportunities for black directors. And so then as a black artist, I want to be able to choose a black director because I want that black director to work even though at the same time I want to be able to choose whoever I want. So I'm in this weird sort of dichotomy of like, what do I do? I want to work with whoever I want, but at the same time there's so limited opportunities for black directors and even black playwrights for that matter. So 
it's a very challenging, challenging, challenging. I, I mean, I can keep going on and on, but I want to be able to share my. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I what I would I think I'm pushing towards a world where I can have um, uh, a director who might be the director who I met, you know, five years ago, and we really clicked, and they enjoy working my work, and we get along, and that when we work together, um, it's not seen that that director was imposed on me, that I actually chose that director. Um, I think there aren't a lot of necessarily opportunities for uh, artists of color. There, there are many opportunities, but I think bringing them together to have a black playwright and a black director scares many people sometimes. It's also really hard to book Kwame Kwame. <laughs> I, actually, I, this is, I would like to answer that, and I know then we're going to wrap up so that people... Although we have, we have a question from a Philly theater company. How sort fantastic. Of a, a challenge. A challenge. From, a challenge from Rise and Walk Theater, mm -hmm. who's, who notes that the question after these forums always is, where do we go from here, which I think Dwight had alluded to. But I wonder if in wrapping up, maybe... Think about that challenge to us and in your way from them. Where do we go from here? Was that you directing me, mate? No, sir. <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> um, I, 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 would, I would very much like to speak to you, and I think what you've said, what's very important is, is parity. If a white director, for once, quote unquote, is directing a piece that is quote unquote black, cool in the gang, are the black right or the black directors getting the chance to work on the classics at the highest level all of the time. And I think that's the dilemma. That's the question. The question isn't whether I can interpret Ibsen or whether someone can't interpret Elmina's Kitchen. That, to me, is a secondary debate. It's about parity. It's about equal access to, 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 to the pie. And I think when we get to a place where, where there is equal access, then I think the debate around race is, is, and culture is secondary. Because if it's a new play in particular, that playwright of color is going to be sitting in the air of that director, no matter who they are, and say, you know, we didn't say it like that in my house. <laughs> and is going to be able to, to guide. If the, you know, so I, I, think it's, I think if there is a debate to be had about the future, and about who's telling our stories and who's guiding our stories, it's about trying to seek greater diversity in, the, di in the, the palette of work being placed before the African-American director. And I think I, I will just do a last round, if I may, uh, and thank you, Philly. Um, as to, um, I, I always worry about the where do we go from here, as if we are somehow going to reinvent the wheel here today. I, I find myself far more interested in, in, in maybe asking each of you to tell me a little and tell us a little bit about the best experience you have had as a playwright and what you would send out to the universe as the way that things really should be done. I'm going to start with you, Lydia. <laughs> when it all comes together sublimely, when the art and the people that you're engaged with and the company that you're being produced by have a shared aesthetic um, uh, imperative that meets a producerial sophistication and then you laugh a lot in the making of it. Have you had one of those experiences? I've had a few of those experiences. Good. Um. <coughs> So I wrote a play about that was inspired by my grandparents and bu them buying a house uh, in Arlington, Massachusetts, uh, and it was put on last spring in Boston. And I think <coughs> what was really warmed my heart as an artist is when people would come up to me after and say, "Thank you for telling my story," simply because when we were doing the dra uh, dramaturgical research, we couldn't find anyone who would talk about it. Mm -hmm. Everyone wanted to say, "Oh, that never happened." You're talking about this. You're talking about that. I was like, "No, no." This is what I'm talking about, and this is what my play is about. And so to have people say either, thank you for telling my story, and those were not all black people, they were also white people, or I didn't know about that. Thank you for letting me uh, spend an evening no learning about that. So and is there a way that we can nurture, we can nurture our theaters? And as, a, as a, an artistic director, I, I would also just throw in, tell me and help me how we, uh, how we create the environment where those experiences that you have are for each and every new play. 
Maybe that's post-show. Hey, that's that's post-show. Just okay, post-show. <laughs> you want me to answer the last question? <laughs> Any of them, brother. Any of them, brother. Um, I will say this. I will say that um, I ditto on the experience being um, when people say I appreciate or thank you for that. Um, I think as far as how to make our theater more vibrant um, and how it's how what we can do next, Philly, um, or I think Philly's that way, um, is that support everyone's work, yeah. not just your own work. Come out to everyone's theater. Come out to the black theater that's on the most remote part of town. Come bring in your entire community and support that work. Because I think what happens is that we subscribe to only supporting institutional work. And, and the folks who, who are in the audience in, in those institutions don't come to the black theater. They don't come to the Asian theater. They don't come to the Native American or LGBT theater. Like, we're all telling each other stories. We're all responsible for our own vitality. So we got to integrate. We got to integrate in order for us to survive as artists and as a community of people. That's what I believe. Lydia, Kristen, I, uh, Keith, I just want to thank you all for traveling from your homes to come to this house on this night to talk about not just race, but who you are <laughs> as artists and the future that you wish for all of us. It is a real honor that you would honor me by being here tonight. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this. Can I catch it? So uh, you'll make your way down to the first floor uh, and uh, quickly. We do want to remind